Hello, hello. Testing. All right. We are live. All righty. How's everyone going? Uh, welcome to the stream. Let's have a look at the chat. All right. So we have all, yeah, all system go. Excellent. So, um, yeah, welcome to the stream. There's, um, there's a little bit of, of lag, I believe, today, uh, but that's all right. Um, so, yeah, I have my chat next to me. So if you have any questions or anything that you would like me to address or just talk about uh, throughout the stream, uh, by all means, just put it in the chat. I'll, I'll see if I can answer those questions. Um, but we're going to continue working on this creepy dude, this, this guy that is, you know, just a creature that we started last stream and I think it's looking uh, pretty pretty creepy we'll see we'll see if we can intensify the the creepiness and the, the creepy factor on this guy uh, and just add a few more details and try to you know define it a little bit more this is still pretty pretty sketchy as in uh, it's mainly the block out with just some slight definition of some details um, most of the I would say the you know smaller details that you see right now um, are just coming from this shader that I created um, it's kind of like a Geiger style type of thing but if I switch to the this matcap gray, you see it's pretty pretty clean. I seen there's no not much detail. So um, I'm just gonna aim to refine this a little bit more and potentially just call it a day <laughs> with this guy. Um, but yeah, this is what we're gonna be working on. Um, other than that, again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll get started. I just want to make sure that all the streams are, are working. So it looks like, yeah, it looks like Twitch is connected, uh, YouTube as well, and Facebook. All right. All good to go. Um, cool. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is just set this to a gray background just to that because it was slightly a green <laughs> before um, and let's go ahead and switch to this basic material um, for the most part I mean having those type of matcaps and everything is is pretty cool and it's great for if you want to do a, a quick uh, render and that sort of thing but uh, for sculpting something clean and simple like this is a lot better to be able to to judge the volumes and the and the primary and secondary shapes. So I think this, you know, this is just one of the best materials for that. Um, I do have a few other ones in case you are, um, you want to do that. <laughs> I'll just test them out. So there's a few materials that I put out. Uh, so there are some sculpting materials that I have. Uh, those are from the ZBrush Guides website. Those are very similar to the basic matcap gray. Um, with a slight tweak, some of them have a bit more of a specular. Some of them have kind of like a like a rim light type of thing um, so the idea is that these materials would help you visualize the volumes a bit um, a bit better as well so in case you want to work with a different color different material but uh, for the most part the matcap gray uh, looks fine all right let's see what we can do with this guy because by the way this if you remember this is still kind of like Dynamesh, well, actually, this is Dynamesh with Sculptris Pro. That's what we did for all those bits and pieces. So um, I want to clean this up a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I just want to be able to block out a few other pieces just to to wrap up, like let's say the the v, the the main silhouette of this guy. So um, I think for the kind of like the mouth the mouth or and this area right here I want to do something a bit more interesting with more um, you know tentacles or something coming through it so let's go ahead and do that um, so one thing that I, I want to do as well is I want to set up my visual or visibility groups uh, by the way if you are part of my email list um, I sent a, a few tips on dealing with subtools that I think are pretty cool and I answered one of the questions that I uh, was asked a couple of a couple of streams ago, if I'm not mistaken, on how to yeah how to deal with certain like a very specific questions on subtools, um, I found a solution. So I just shared it in in the email. 
Uh, by the way, guys, let me know in the chat just to double check that everything is working. If you can hear me right and if you can see everything um, screen, feel free to to say hi on the chat to make sure that um, all the all the channels are uh, working correctly. Um, yeah, but so to to set up the the visual or the visibility groups, uh, basically the idea. Um, hang on, <laughs> it says that uh, congratulations. I received a hundred messages today, <laughs> but uh, I don't see any yet. So <laughs> maybe uh, maybe there's something. Uh, this I'll delay or something. Um, yeah, so the visibility groups are these things that you can see here at the top, and they're very easy to set up. I want to use them so that I can work on, let's say, the body without being affected by the legs. And instead of going on each leg one at a time and hiding them and that sort of thing, I can create visibility groups for that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, like I said, they're very easy to set up. I'm going to set the first one by selecting this piece that I want. And I'm going to go to visibility 2 or V2. And that automatically hides everything. And obviously, I can see the one that I have selected, so I'm just going to enable that. And I'm going to enable anything else that I want to include in this um, visibility group. Okay, so this, ah, oh, forgot I had like three sort of pieces making the body. <laughs> All right, so those three. And let's bring in the eyes as well, just as a reference. And that's it, right? So that's the visibility group one. So if I go, sorry, two. So if I go back to one, it's everything to is this obviously depending on what you have selected that will be visible when you switch between groups or between uh, visibility groups so let's say if you wanna uh, let's say I just want to work on the oh one more thing I want to enable for this one is the tail um, let's say I want to just work on the legs for instance I can go to visibility 3 which automatically shows me the body just because that's the one I have selected but let's click on the legs Right, so now it's hidden, and let's enable just these bits for the for the legs. All right, so now I can work on the legs separately, or like you know, visualize them separately. Then the body again, um, it is showing the legs because I have that selected. So I just need to hold the Alt key and select that one, and it will be hidden. And then V1 for everything. Cool. So I just have that visibility group. Um, if you haven't used them. I would recommend to try them out because they're pretty cool and they will speed up your workflow, especially when you work with lots and lots of different sub tools. Um, this is this is very conservative for the type of projects that I do. Um, I sometimes end up with a hundred different sub tools or, or more. So having visibility groups really helps. Cool. All right. So let's um, let's see what we can do. I'm start. I'm I'm still trying to figure out what would be the best way of. Um, going on about it. I, I think, you know, let's just, let's just do something simple, but cool. I'm going to append a cylinder. So like that. And this is going to be one of the, you know, pieces of the jaw, um, kind of like rigid tentacles or something. <laughs> um, still don't know what it would be. And I'm just going to scale it in the Y axis. Right, so this would be, let's say, something like that, like around there, right? Um, but obviously, let's place this a little bit better. So this would be one. Let's let's do kind of like the main one or like the more prominent one, and then we can duplicate this piece and and do a bit more. Now. With this, this is like a super basic uh, blockout, and of course you can use you know the move brush and everything just to to tweak it and and create something interesting. Uh, for me, using the deformers in this case and the um, the, the focal shift and the gizmo, it's just really easy. So um, because I haven't moved or changed the the pivot or the rotation, right? Um, I have access to the uh, the deformers in the original volume of this. Um, cylinder. So what that means is that I can click on the gear icon here and let's select the taper deformer and you'll see it is aligned to that uh, cylinder because I haven't changed the, the rotation or the, or the pivot. So let's go ahead and do something like this. 
and the white icon here this this cone allows you to change that profile of the tapering so you can make it kind of like a like a bullet or just more like a tentacle which is what i want like a more uh, more gradual transition and let's click accept right and again i'm still having that um, gizmo aligned with the volume of the cylinder so i can use something like the bend curve right so the bend curve allows you to create points along the volume uh, based on the axis that you have selected so right now it's set to the uh, y axis which is fine and uh, so i'm going to click on the orange cone and i'm going to increase that to yeah six points or five points um, and i think that's that's good um, and then i can just go ahead and start moving those points and that's how i can in a way pose this tentacle from different angles. All right, I'm gonna click your icon, accept, and there we go. So this is kind of like the, the, the first one of a few that I'm planning to add. Um, hopefully that was going to look creepy enough and, and good. Um, let's see the chat. Hey, Cozy. Uh, what is this program? <laughs> this is ZBrush. Cool, all right. So um, yeah, so now if I go to solo mode, this is what I have, um, which is, you know, fair enough, but because I stretched that original cylinder, these polygons are a little bit stretched. So I'm just going to click uh, zero mesh to do a quick zero measure. And I'm going to click on half, half, like, sorry, not click on half, click on zero measure again with half enabled so that it just um, halves the amount of polygons, maybe one more. Nah, it's too greedy. This one, this one is fine. And I'm going to smooth this step. Right. So now that it's a lot, you know, a lot cleaner in terms of the of the base of the topology, if I click Dynamics of Division, it's going to give me uh, a pretty smooth result. Um, let's turn that off for the time being. And I'm just going to duplicate it and send it to my original folder just to keep one of those in there. Uh, but then I'm going to go into solo mode. Uh, by the way, another tip that I send in my in my newsletter, which is something that you might find interesting, um, I find it pretty useful when I'm when I'm dealing with uh, the comic style material, for instance. So um, let me just show you what that means. This has nothing to do with what we're doing. It's just a, kind of like an extra unrelated tip. Um, so when I select, let's say, the comic material, which is this one right here, you'll notice that the subtools that I don't have selected or that are not active. They are slightly, you know, darker. They're a bit gray compared to the to the tentacle in this case, which is white. Um, you can change that from the preference palette, edit, and go to this uh, inactive dimming subtool. So you can just set this to one, and now everything is going to be the same kind of like um, brightness, right? So it's going to be harder to identify which one is the subtool that you have selected. So in this particular case, and again, it's very specific to a uh, to this workflow, um, or at least I find it useful for this particular thing. So in this case, that it's harder to identify which one is the one that you have selected, you can hold the Alt key and click on a subtool and then go into solo mode just to double check. Yeah, that's the one, the eyes, yeah, that's the one. Um, but if you don't have solo mode in your in your UI or you don't have it mapped uh, to any key, I have it to the map to the Z, uh, to the S key. Um, what you can do is in the same preference palette in the edit, Palette, you can enable this allow click to solo, and by default it should be off. But it's a pretty cool one in this in this case. And what that allows you to do is that if you can click once in the canvas, Zero is going to go into solo mode for whatever you have selected. So I have the eye selected. I can just click once in the canvas, and now I'm in solo mode. I can click again, and I'm out of solo mode. I'm gonna hold the Alt key, go to this tentacle, click once. I'm in solo mode. Click again. I'm out of solo mode. So pretty handy stuff, I think. And again, it's specifically for this um, yeah, workflow of dealing with the, um, the comic shader, which allows you, 
you know, it's it allows you to do this type of comic style, but it also um, needs, I, I reckon, <laughs> it needs to have um, less dimming in the subtool. So that's why I changed that. Uh, so I'm gonna turn that off. Um, but again, it's a it's a pretty cool thing to do. Anyway, let's go back to solo. That's that's the whole point uh, that I wanted to to show the the solo option. Uh, but in solo mode, I'm gonna hold the Alt key and reposition this pivot around there. And this is purely so that it's easy for me to manipulate this um, tentacle from the kind of like the root and place it in other places. So again, holding the Alt key. Um, all right. Cool. Just gonna try to position this a bit better. Because this one is, um, I think it's gonna be the, the largest one, I think. So. Once we place this main one, the other ones should be should follow a little bit of the the flow. And of course, we can tweak that later with the with the move rush. Uh, so I'm gonna hold the control key and click and drag, and that automatically duplicates this mesh. So I'm just gonna play with rotation and scale, and I'm gonna try to maintain the scale uniform. Just for the time being. And like I said, try to maintain kind of like a flow of these pieces. Uh, again, hold control, click and drag to duplicate again. So um, I'm gener generating a bit of variety purely with the, the use of, you know, the scale and the rotation before I go into a bit more details with the with the move brush for instance. All right. So and of course I'm doing everything one side and then we will mirror and weld the rest. Hold control, click and drag. And you see with the same uh sort of asset or same same mesh we can Variating f like just a few attributes, like I said, rotation and scale, we can generate some uh, some interesting some interesting visuals. We, we don't have to really create like a completely different one every time. Uh, although we can tweak it to make it look even more um, different. <laughs> so uh, just hold Control again, duplicate, scale it. We'll have to figure out how they actually fit into the mouth, but yeah, I think that's that's looking <laughs> creepy enough. Let's hold control, click and drag again. Another thing that we can do as well, um, before again, before we jump into the more manual uh, tweaking is to, let's say if you want something a bit larger, right? Like a bit longer and you want to scale it in proportional, um, or like, yeah, proportionally. Um, but you don't want it to be that thick compared to the other ones because we have everything masked out. We can go to the deformation palette and this might um, give us some artifacts here towards the, the, the tip of this tentacle, but um, you know, it's not a big deal. We can easily fix that. So we can go to inflate and go to the minus values just to make it negative. Uh, this, is the <laughs> this is the artifacts that I mentioned just because at this stage, because yeah, at this stage, the inflate, what it does is pushes the geometry based on their normal. So this is kind of like flipping it. <laughs> so maybe that's not going to work. So if you had something that didn't have these um, loops kind of like converging into this point and these small polygons, you could just get away with that. Um, but yeah, um, that was just an extra thing again. <laughs> um, let's, go, let's go ahead and finish this up. I won't spend too much time on this. And let me have a look how this is looking with the with the legs as well. 
Oh, I changed my. Oh, that was an issue. that was an error. <laughs> I changed my visual groups. All good. Um, I think one more, and then we're good to go. So I'm going to hold control, click and drag to clear that mask. And basically, um, hang on. Um, he's saying, can I take a break and explain the <laughs> extractor brush? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there's not much to explain about the extractor brush. Maybe I can show you how that works once we get to detailing. Um, later on. So yeah, I, I could use extractor brushes to add some details later. I just wanted to finish this, this block out first. All right, so I'm going to enable dynamic just so I can see a, a nicer, smoother version of this. Switch to the move topological with the accurate curve and a large brush. And this will allow me to do those tweaks and refinements so that they don't look exactly the same. Plus, I can also hold the shift key and smooth things out. So they, again, they're not as thick. All right, I think this, this looks all right. Let's go ahead and do mirror and mirror and weld. So now we have those tentacles <laughs> uh, in the same subtool and they have dynamic subdivision. And obviously because we did a, a simpler topology, they already look pretty pretty decent in terms of the, um, the base topology. So that's, um, that's ideal. Uh, other than that, I think we can go ahead and yeah, define this a little bit more. All right, so I'm going to use my standard strong from the HR Geiger pack. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know, this is a part of a, one of the packs that I have online. But if you want to recreate something similar to this brush, you can just take the standard brush and increase the, the intensity, the Z intensity, and it should give you a, a similar result. So I'll, I'll use this one just to add more emphasis here in the gaps or in the, they're kind of like panels, but you know, not necessarily panels. I guess they're same, they're part of the same panel, <laughs> but um, they have these, um, these more clear divisions there. And you could also uh, split them up and have something like what you have, uh, what we have here in the, the top of the of the body, uh, in this area. But this area is just a, a single mesh. And the reason I want to keep it like that is because then you can do things with a standard brush like this, just to, to again, redefine that abdomen of the creature. So. This is what I would uh, refer to as, you know, tweaking the, the secondary shapes and make sure that all of those are working before detailing. Um, and it's something that I spend a lot of time doing in like in, if I were doing this for, um, for a client or something like that, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stage of the process that I enjoy and that I think is really necessary to, um, to create something that is more memorable that has more of an impact um, just because even though this is a creature that doesn't exist and it's fantasy or sci-fi or, or whatever, um, as long as you can make it that it's plausible, it 
uh, it would have uh, it would have that sort of impact. It will make your audience or your um, your viewers believe that even though it, they know it is fake or that it is not real, that it could exist in whatever world you're building. So those these type of um, secondary shapes not only give that the, I think they ground the design a little bit, um, and it gives that sort of validity that to say, okay, this guy could actually work. There's some kind of indication of the the muscles that go, you know, underneath that abdomen and carcasses or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, I would spend a lot of time <laughs> in, in this stage, uh, but this is, you know, obviously we only have a couple of hours, so this is kind of like trying to give you um, a sped up version of, of my entire <laughs> workflow, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the idea. I'm using the standard brush just to add some volumes here and there and just refine um, some of the lines. And I'm maintaining the same sort of resolution as well. All right, so I'm going to hold the Alt key and switch to this other piece that uh, maybe let's give it a bit of a color so that you can see the difference because it's just like the middle piece right is this original mesh that we started from and ha this is the mesh that we used to extract all the other pieces and the other yeah the other meshes so um, I kept that and I'm using that to sort of like create a, an additional layer of um, <laughs> panels so I'm going to use the uh, move topological, sorry, the move brush with the accu curve and just a bit of refinement here. So again, all of these pieces could be split up and we could separate them, um, but I think there's no need. I mean, we could, but I think what for what for what we need, I think they they're fine. As, as they are. And we can just de define them a little bit better. Just a second. So we could use something like the the HR Geiger cutter. Uh, if you don't have this, um, the dam standard brush or the slash three are pretty decent for that as well. This is just a stronger version. Again, most of the, the custom brushes that I have and custom assets, I build them for myself, <laughs> for my own workflows. And some of them, I tweak them and refine them so that they are useful for most people um, in their workflow. So this is the case of, like this is a, a, a pretty good example of what I mean. Um, it is similar to the standard brush. I think it even uses, sorry, the dam standard brush. It even uses, yeah, it uses the same alpha that the dam standard brush is using. It's just that, you know, I tweak some of the settings to make it work for me and, and that way, I can speed up my own workflows a little bit and that way again I can work a bit faster. So that's the that's the idea with the custom brushes. They're just to speed up workflows. Um so yeah. This allows me to do this type of really quick cuts, really sharp and strong cuts. Um which again you can do with the dumb standard brush. It's just probably a bit faster for me to do it now with this but you don't have to. All right, so um, let's, let's also use the clay brush. Um, and I can potentially, you know, I mean, this mesh, the thing with this mesh is <laughs> that um, you can only see a little bit of it, but it is a big, it is a big piece, right? So if I just DynaMesh, I'm gonna be needing to DynaMesh this in a higher resolution so that I can see the details on these areas right um but there's a bunch of geometry and volume that is pointless so we'll have to tweak that uh, or fix that later but just for the time being i'm gonna um, use the sculptress pro and that way i can sort of target a specific area that i want and that way i can work on just this area like adding volumes to this area and more resolution <laughs> that's what i meant um yeah so one thing i need to do is use the back face masking so that I don't affect the back of this. 
oops, forgot to enable that. Um, some features of the Sculptris Pro don't really work with auto masking tools. So that back face, back, back face masking doesn't um, doesn't work with the with the Sculptris Pro. So just be aware of that. Alrighty. I'm gonna do a similar thing here with the Sculptures Pro just to define these areas a bit more. And what I wanna create really is just that sense of panels over panels uh, that, that feel organic. So they create kind of like out the outer edges or not the edges but the the shell really of this creature is kind of like a crustaceous type of thing and it is based on one a, a real thing that i didn't know existed like a really weird looking um shrimp like thing <laughs> um i forgot the name of it but it's pretty cool All right, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, does it say that, <laughs> is it, is it Shane in the titles again? Yeah, I don't know why, what that happens. Um, Sometimes the the titles they don't get updated, and it looks like I'm I'm Shane. <laughs> um, I was wondering how long does a personal project usually takes for you? A personal project can take months, and you know depending on the on how long I or how excited I am on the project could take like an entire year. I don't know. This, you know, personal projects are a different thing. Um, I try to keep myself busy with lots of different things at the same time because I'm a person that gets really really bored with the same thing with monotony so you know I I like to I like to switch between things so if if you look at the stuff that I do and the things that I share online maybe not everything is in my let's say my portfolio but I tend to do creatures characters uh, creepy stuff kind of like more cute stuff um, environments props you know just things that are more design type of thing like you know i spend time um doing things for my website like designing stuff and you know it's 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 very different so it's hard for me <laughs> i guess that's the answer it's hard for me to give you like a like an estimate estimate on how long a personal project takes because every project is different and the nature of the project itself will change how long things take um but um if you mean like how long would it take me to do something like this like what i'm showing you right now to do uh again it depends on the level of polish and how i want to finish um this character but i think let's say uh, um a couple weeks would be a decent time frame for a project provided that i have enough time to to work on it but that's the other thing I, because i have lots of different things going on um you know my my freelance job um doing some stuff for some studios and you know the the my academy online which is uh, what i spend a lot of time as well uh, making sure that everything is running smoothly then i don't have enough time to to say all right i can do this in a couple of days because that means only two days will be dedicated to this and not to the rest of the other projects. <laughs> um, don't know if that makes sense, but so yeah, if if I only had, if I could spend, if I could afford spend just a time just working on this on a personal project, I reckon I could get something that I'm happy with in terms of quality and and everything else um, in in a week, right? 
but that's not the the case. That's not the reality, and I don't think it's the the case for most people. Anyway, we all have a bunch of different things and stuff that we try to juggle. Um. So yeah. Actually, now <laughs> that that we're on the on the topic, um, if you want to have a a rough idea of the projects and how long it takes me to do the personal stuff. Um, the 3D snippets website is where I do that. Um, and this is kind of like my, my playing ground. And that allows, that allows you to see or to have, um, to experience basically what I do on a personal project every month. So the idea is that every month I pick a, with, you know, with the help of the, the subscribers to that, um, to that project, uh, I pick a topic or a subject. Um, and then I develop a project usually around that subject. So um, to give you an idea, we did a few months ago last year, we did uh, a creature that's called Smokey or something like that. And it has um, it has lots of, it's a creature that is covered in, in fibers, right, in, in hair. And we did, you know, fiber mesh for that. And we use that month to, to cover, obviously, the the production of that project and the focus was fiber mesh, right? So that's the type of thing that we do. We just pick something that we can spend some time on and yeah, and practice that or even test new things. Um, a couple of months ago as well, I I worked purely on, uh, what's the name? Phot photogrammetry, which I haven't, I haven't done properly ever. <laughs> so um, it becomes kind of like, um, like I said, like a testing ground for me of trying new different things. And it allows myself to, it allows me to, to produce new work and personal work. So um, that is probably a good reference to, to show you the, the type of things that we can create in a month, for example, if we have time. Uh, but anyway, I think I digressed. Um, will you be using the noisemaker on this sculpt? Um, maybe I don't. I don't have a plan for it, but we could use it if you're interested in in seeing some some work with that. Definitely, it's not. Uh, it's a it's a pretty cool tool for adding high frequency details. But at this stage, again, I'm not really too worried about it. We're still defining the the sculpt, so. All right, I think that piece is is good to go. Um, yeah, I think so. So what I think I'm gonna do is just, now that I have defined this a bit better, um, maybe let's push some of these areas that are visible. Um, see, so what I'm going to do is combine these two together. So let's just do a quick refinement of of the shapes, and we will combine this bit or this this mesh with the one below. So let's do merge down. So now this is a single mesh, right? I mean, it's a, it's, there are two separate pieces. I can still auto group them. And in fact, let's just duplicate and save one in here in case we need them. Uh, but now there are two separate pieces and what I can do is go ahead and do a dynamic. Now watch what's gonna happen. <laughs> let's turn this on so that you can see better. I'm gonna click dynamic. And by clicking Dynamesh, obviously we combine this and now this is a single piece, but we're losing quite a few details and the definition that we spend some time doing, right? And that is because, yeah, Sibrush is trying to um, basically, based on the, re and the resolution of the Dynamesh that we have, is trying to assign the same size of polygons to every everything. So we wouldn't have to, if we want to keep all of these details and all this definition, um, we would have to definitely <laughs> essentially just increase the resolution quite a bit. So instead of that, um, there are a couple of things we can do. Um, but the one that I'm gonna use is a simple um, remesh and project. So 
I'm going to use a separate tool so that it's easier. I don't get you know a bunch of tools here. It becomes messy. So with this one selected, I'm going to click Clone. Select that. So now this is a separate tool in ZBrush. I'm going to duplicate it, right? I'm going to select the one on, at the bottom, maybe hide the other one. Um, again, I've, I've explained this in, in previous streams, like, you know, how I, how I have this tool that automatically generates a nice topology. So I'm going to use it just to show you what it does. So it is this one right here, the Dynet to Subdi. This is a custom macro that I'm going to click on it. It goes through a process of doing um, uh, redynamesh for all the pieces right now is going to end up with two separate objects because again we haven't combined it I just wanted to show you how that works and you see it is an automated automated process that gives me this nicer resolution or like nice uh, I think we can even go one lower actually we can reconstruct one yeah um, so we have a nice, simpler topology. I mean, a nicer topology is not perfect, but I think it's pretty decent for what we need, right? We have that um, that topology, and we can also go to the highest subdivision level where we have most of those details. And this is this is something automated that um, that I use for concepts very quickly. Having um, subdivision levels allows me to go to the lowest subdivision and make large proportional changes, and you know play around with the proportions again, um, create quick UVs, that sort of thing. Again, this is still two separate meshes, so I can hide them, right? And separate them if I wanted to, but I do want to have a single mesh. So let's, uh, let's just hide this one. We don't need it. Let's duplicate that. Um, so instead of running that automated action, what I'll do is go to the Gizmo 3D, click on the gear icon, uh, maybe turn off symmetry gear icon and I'm going to click on remesh by union so remesh by union is a kind of like a boolean operation um, it says that it's not a valid one for some reason but I think it did it anyway let's, let's just double check that it worked no it didn't work um, so I'm just wondering why that is, let's undo that. All right, so because we used um, Sculptris Pro, there might be some like tiny holes or things that we don't see <laughs> easily. So I'm just gonna click on close holes and that did something, I don't know what. Uh, I'm also going to assign a single polygroup to everything and now I'm going to repeat the process I'm going to click on the gear icon remesh by union see if that one works it should yep so now it worked so yeah again when you use Sculptures Pro because of the nature of how that tool works creating triangles and all of that you might end up with tiny holes sometimes so it's good to perform um, that action that I just did the close holes and then run this so the remesh by union is a boolean operation basically Wherever there is an intersection between two meshes in ZBrush, ZBrush is going to take that and basically remove whatever is inside, like the, the hidden geometry, and it's going to connect those two. So let's click on Accept. If I go closer here, you'll see this is what happens, right? So in the, in the mesh on the top, or the one, yeah, the one at the top, we had all of these triangles, which are the result of the Sculptures Pro, and the one at the bottom is, yeah, the other mesh, the Dyna mesh but the size of the polygons are not different, or are different, sorry. Um, so ZBrush needs to create all of these triangles and all of these points in order to connect the two. But that's what the, the Boolean operation uh, that I just did, the remesh by union. Now, if I go ahead and hold the Shift key without Sculptures Pro, actually, and smooth this out, you'll see all of those weird geometry, uh, but it's necessary to, to create it. So this is a process that is really important in the for the next step so that we can keep all the details and all the definition but is now a single object so now this single object just to keep the you know keep this as part of the process and show you now that i have this mesh what i'll do is we can duplicate it again although the one at the top should be exactly the same thing so 
let's actually just leave it as it is. And this one is the one that I'm going to enable um, symmetry. And I'm going to click on adapt and click on serial mesh. So now I'm going to do the same process that I did automatically before with one click, but manually so that I can control how much I want to simplify this mesh. And then we're going to recover all the details by projecting that sketch. So if you haven't done this process, this might sound like extremely confusing, but I'll, I'll show you. So now, even though this is still super high res, uh, well, not high res, but it's, it has 300,000 polygons, you'll see that now we have quads and there's some areas like this that need some refinement. So you could just manually go like this and fix that. Uh, but I'm just gonna run another Siri mesha with have enable and adapt as well. So Siri is going to, every time that you click Siri measure, it's going to cut the amount by half ideally. So we have 300,000 polygons. So now we have 150 roughly. So it just cut it by half. It will get to a point where, let's do it again. It will get to a point where it, it doesn't cut it by half anymore. And that is because you have the adapt on. And that means the Siri is trying to cut it by half, but at the same time, it's trying to adapt the the size of the topology and the size of the, the polygons to the crevices. So yeah, um, if you get to a point where you see, let's say this is a, a good example. Uh, right now I have 50,000 polygons. So let's click on zero measure. Ideally we'll get uh, around 25,000, ideally. So yeah, it didn't do exactly half. It's more like 31,000. So if I do it one more time, then it would be ideally 15,000, but it just does. 20 and that is because of the adapt is on and if you notice let's say the polygons around here at the top are slightly bigger than the ones that you see here around the edges um, and there's a lot more loops and that is what the adapt does it just tries to adapt the topology so that when you remesh it it keeps those um, those areas you know with more um, topology so you can add more details but if you turn this off and click zero measure we should have 10, around 10. So now it is more accurate that half of the polygons. And it still does a pretty decent job. So let me undo that. I prefer to have adapt in this case that is pretty organic, even though I'm, I'm not cutting it uh, by half or like reducing it by half. So at this point, you see, even though half and adapt is enabled and I run it, it doesn't, doesn't do much. If I do it one more time, in this case, kind of did it <laughs> because I'm losing a lot of the details, but I think I think I'm happy with something like this. All right, so I'm gonna get out of solo mode, bring in the other one, right? So this is the sketch, um, and this is something that I do. It's just like muscle memory for me to to essentially project everything and then subdivide, project, subdivide, project, um, because that's how it was. That's how it worked better before, but nowadays. Zeroish can do a pretty good job if you just subdivide everything, let's say, to 2 million polygons, right? And then you just go ahead and, and project from, by the way, project is here, right? So this is the tools that I have in my UI. I can go ahead and click project. So Zeroish is going to take that sketch that I have here at the top, the, the first subtool, and whatever we did, all the details are going to be projected into this high resolution mesh that we have with um, nicer subdivision. So there's a, there's a bit of a, an issue here and you can fix that in a few different ways. So you can fix that by increasing the distance in here and the, uh, yeah, the distance should do the trick. So let me undo that. Um, and that's kind of like a cage that if you increase that, Sirius will be able to, to project more. So those artifacts are created because they, the distance of the projection is not, so it fixed, yeah, it's not there. So it fixed some areas, but this one is still a pretty chunky one. So let me undo that. Um, and this really is the reason why I personally liked to use the, let me undo all of that. I like to use the, the little by little, one by one projection <laughs> type of workflow. So uh, what that means is that at this level of subdivision, I can project and I can see whether there's gonna be some issues. Right, um, and I think the, I think I went too far with the, with the sub with the um, remesh. So
let's see how we go. I'm gonna smooth everything a, a little bit. Subdivide one more time, project all, and this is where we started to see some of the issues. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the main problem is that there are, there's, um, there's an issue with the underlying topology, we might have to do it again. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily going to work. So let's go back a bit. Around there. Let's try to project that one. Still not ideal. So I'm just trying to figure out where they... Okay, I know where some of the issue happened. All right, so if you look at this um, area right here, there's a very close gap. And when I do the zero measure, it's sort of like, you'll see, it just opens that, that gap. Uh, so when it projects, because it is very, very close, um, it's just going to try to project from one side into the other or doesn't really know what to do. So I have to keep an eye on that when I do the zero meshing. All right, so what I'm going to do to maintain this with a relatively decent polygon. <laughs> I'm just going to project what we have at this stage. Right? So that projection is already in a nicer topology. The difference is that it's still pretty, pretty dense. So I'm going to do the zero measure now. Again, with half and adapt on. So that, again, should improve the topology as in making, uh, making it a little bit more manageable. And then I can project again. So it's basically every time that I do the zero measure to cut it in half, I'm at the same time I'm projecting the the sketch so that we can maintain everything tied in these areas, right? So project will do that. So let's do that one more time. And that way we can also ensure that when we go up in subdivision levels to project details, um, we can maintain those. <laughs> let's project, so you'll see it does a much better job if we do it manually. Um, this usually is not the case. For the most part, it does a pretty good job um, straight out of the bat. Like just when you when you do the first zero measure, we um, you know half on a bunch of times. It does a pretty good job. But this is a, a pretty easy workaround when you find those projection details uh, issues. So I just projected those again, and we are already at 55. Um, by the way, you can automate all of this. Let me just project that as well. You can, you can pretty much create a macro for this where you can go zero measure by half, then project, zero measure by half, project, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I don't, that saves some of the manual work, but, you know, this is how, this is how I would go about it <laughs> just to fix those issues. All right, and I'm just using the smooth brush quickly just to clean some areas here. Um, I think that's all right. We have 26,000. We could go a little bit lower, but I don't need lower than this. Um, if I were to just do proper retopology, um, this would be a lot cleaner, <laughs> but this is for, uh, for a quick concept anyway. So yeah, so now we can just go ahead and divide, project all, divide, project all, divide, project all. And because the base mesh that we retopologized, the lower subdivision level, we also projected that as we remesh it. Um, now we have a cleaner set of polygons. So this, um, I mean, there's some tiny artifacts, but that's just a quick, smooth brush operation. Um, in fact, now that we have all of this, I'm just going to polish things a little bit.
and this is our clean mesh. Obviously, it's still pretty lumpy in some areas, so we can clean that up as well. But this is already um, a mesh that we can go to the lowest subdivision level and the highest one. So now that I finished with this um, convoluted process, process, which is not that that hard to be honest, I just encountered a few issues and wanted to show you the workarounds. But I'm gonna copy this, go back to my working file, paste it, so it will feel fit the same place. Let's take the original and drop it into the folder, and that's it. So now I can just go all low and have this low res mesh. And now I can do the same thing with this one. So I'm just gonna bring all the rest of the subtools to the same sort of level. Um, although I think this one, I might be able to show you something interesting and pretty cool. Um, because, yeah, I think I'm gonna show you something really cool, like a, an, a really awesome trick with this one. Uh, to retopologize this this bit. Let me just see if there is any questions so far. Um, maybe the stream like things you said, this is based on our isopod. Um, no, they, they call, um, I forgot the name, it's, it has a weird name. I'll show you which ones they are though. I have them in, um, in a creature reference thingy. They call Epimeria. Epimeria loricata, not sure. Yeah, which is this one, by the way. It's based on this creature. It's really weird. Um, I believe this is a um, um, crustaceous thing. Not sure. Epimeria loricata. If you wanna just type that in, in Google, you'll get the the result. But yeah, you see, it's it's based on that thing. You know, has like that sort of spiky helmet and all these. Um, it's it's just an alien creature, <laughs> an alien living among us, um, and it's a real thing. I didn't know it existed, and it has that really cool sort of armor-like transparency thing. Really queer, weird stuff. Um, but anyway, that's the one that I'm using, kind of like as a reference. I'm just gonna keep it here. Um, cool. Uh, let me see. Um, cool. Um, sorry, I'm just like looking at the at the chat. What computer you need for to for to do uh, what I'm doing? Uh, I don't. Um, just go to the Pixelogy website. They have all the specs in there. I, I really don't don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not that tech savvy in that uh, in that sense. <laughs> like when when I need to rebuild my computer, I do a lot of research and, and ask some friends that are much more uh, well versed in the in the world of computers. I know that the one that I have is pretty pretty powerful, like for you know for this day and age, but. Um, yeah, I don't even remember the. Uh, I know like a graphics card. The graphics card that I have is the RTX um, 3090, which is pretty awesome, and it's the Founders Edition and, and all of that. But that doesn't make a difference for ZBrush. ZBrush is based on the um, GPU anyway. Sorry, in the CPU. Um, cool, cool. Tune in. All right. Uh, is my UI available to buy or no? It's free. You can download it if you um, if you go to my YouTube channel, like my personal YouTube channel. There is a video there um, that is called "Customizing Your UI with a Purpose," and in the description of that file, you can get on that video you can get this file for right-handed people and for left-handed people. Uh, plus, I show you how to customize it and make it your own in case you wanted to. So you can use my custom UI as a base to create your own or just you know, use this one if you want. Um, cool. Oh, by the way, just a couple of things before I forget. Uh, just because you mentioned it, or oh, some of you guys mentioned it, so. Um, so if you go to my YouTube channel, 
Hang on, my internet is a little bit slow now. Um, ah, here we go, sorry. <laughs> Just took a while. Um, here it is. So if you go to um, to my channel, um, I might be able to just copy and paste this actually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my, um, I have another big issue with my, with my Bluetooth things. Right? Um, I have a Bluetooth mouse, a Bluetooth um, keyboard and all of that, but it just doesn't work for some reason after um, a Windows update. I cannot even see my Bluetooth icon. So I have no Bluetooth anymore in my computer. So if anyone knows <laughs> like a fix for that, uh, I cannot even find the Bluetooth uh, option to turn it on and off or anything like that. So um, yeah, so all my extra devices are um, of no use. Sorry, uh, so this this is the, um, the channel. So if you scroll to um, the uploads, by the way, if you wanna catch up with previous sessions, uh, I have a playlist that is called Make It Happen in Seabridge and it has all the playlists and all the sessions from uh, this channel, right? From the Seabridge Live. Uh, but if you go to uh, maybe popular uploads, no, but... Um, maybe not here, maybe... Ah, uh, yeah, so customize, custom uh, Seabridge UI with a purpose. So if you click on that one and you scroll down, I'll show more so you can click yeah so this is the link if you click on here um that will download the the ui that i'm using for zbrush uh you just need to make sure that you have at least 2021.6.4 uh i think that's the one i i use when i created this tutorial at the time so um in order to load it the custom ui that i have it's um you have to have it in there um yeah cool also, by the way, guys, uh, I don't know if probably have, I should have mentioned this before. Um, I have a I have a workshop called the Asset Library Workshop that is going to be a live workshop for five days, and it's coming up at the end of the month. We have about thirteen days to go um, before we go into the live sessions, and there are still some seats available, but they are running low, <laughs> so I don't think they they're gonna last because um, we have limited seats because it is a live session. So I don't think it's gonna last longer than this week. So if you're interested, I would uh, recommend just going and, and grabbing your spot. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll also send you the link in case you're interested in that, because um, it's gonna be pretty cool. And we're gonna build a bunch of high quality assets from zbrush brushes, advanced brushes, uh, materials, PBR, uh, alphas, uh, textures, all sorts of really cool things, lighting environments. We're gonna try to cover it all so that you can build your own um, useful library of assets. And at the end of the workshop, um, I'm gonna try to give you a bit of the um, kind of like self-promotion and marketing and things that I use in my personal uh, projects as well, so that you can also sell your assets or or share them if you want. Um, so yeah, just have a look at these. Um, these are some of the references of the things that I've done and built for assets like the Geiger packs, some um, you know, the the clay brushes in ZBrush, uh, some lighting environments, the skin brushes, blah, 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 all of that. So yeah, have a look at this. Uh, and if you're interested, um, make sure that you enroll, um, you know, this week, I think, I think we have, um, we have a few, yeah, we have a few spot lefts, but um, this week should, should cover them all. Um, all right, so let's back to what I was saying before. I want to show you something really cool with this um, top area. So I'm going to clone it again, just work on a separate. By the way, I'm going to click on a quick save just in case. Um, and now, right, this is what we have. Obviously, we have Dynamesh as well as uh, Sculptris Pro working together. Every single piece that has a different color is separate object. So if I hold control and shift, I can isolate that bit, right? So I could go ahead and do the same process that I just showed you before with the, um, with the previous, with the body, right? So I can do the remesh by union and all of that um, to project the details and have an, a nicer low res mesh. The problem with that 
is that if I want to be able to to manipulate things separately, right? If I want to isolate this or if I want to move this separately, all of these kind of like paneling overlapping um, are going to be joined together, right? So that's that becomes uh, an issue. So there's there's a, a few different workarounds for this. Um, which one of them is going to be uh, pretty pretty amazing if it works. <laughs> um, so I've tried it before and it worked. So I know it works, but I might forget some of the steps. I'm just going to go purely by what makes sense right now to me. So <laughs> I'm going to take this and I'm going to duplicate it, right? And what I'll do is set the home state and the target state to be completely different and separated, right? And the idea, the theory behind what I'm going to do is I'm going to explode this mesh to have them all separate. And then I'm going to perform the the serial measure and the projection in that exploded state. And because we can save the home and target, we can bring them back together. So that's the theory. Let's see if that we can we can make it happen. So um, let's call this the home state, right? Or home stage, sorry. And you'll find that in 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 in, in um, position, I think. No, stag stager. So in the geometry palette, this one, this stager, right? So that basically tells ZBrush, okay, remember this is the home stage. This is how I want things to look like or to be uh, in terms of the placement and the rotation scale and all of that of this mesh. But because we have polygroups, we can then hold Control and Shift, mask that, invert, unmask that. And we're just gonna, oops, make sure. This one is there. All right, let's see if this works. <laughs> it might be, it might be um, too extreme, but I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna split, not split, but like mask. First of all, sorry, I'll, I'm already all over the place. <laughs> I'm gonna explode this into parts that have like quite a bit of a um, distance between each other. So because I have polygroups, I can hold the control and shift to select it. Hold control click once to mask it, invert it, or bring back everything, invert the mask, right? Bring in the gizmo, we can center to the unmask areas, and I can bring it here. Okay, I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna try to do it a little bit faster so you don't get bored with what I'm doing. By the way, if you just want to, um, you just want to have a a clean topology. If you run the the serial measure process with uh, keeping groups, you can totally do that, and you don't have to do what I'm doing at the moment. the The reason I'm doing <laughs> what I'm doing, um, or like the only purpose of this would be to, at the time of the projection, to have no um. Kind of like interference with other pieces that's really the only reason uh, so that we can keep everything separate with all the details and everything um, there might be another way to do it now that i think about it which is once you have everything in the same place and everything uh, you can just hide pieces and just project on a single piece but anyway this is a cool project a cool process anyway so might as well show you um all right, <laughs> so now that I have all these mesh all exploded, this is still the same subtool, right? I want to click on target stage, right? So I should be able to switch between, oh no, of course, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, I don't know, I, m I must have missed something. Uh, yeah, I've done this before. I don't know what happened. So basically, uh, you know what? <sighs> of course, sorry. So this is a single subtool. It would work if we have this as a bunch of different subtools, but I forgot to do that. 
So I'll show you the other option, which is going to be a lot easier, actually. I just thought that it was going to be cool, but... Yeah, you will have to um, essentially do the same thing, but you can split everything into different... I I'll show you so that it... You know, so that you do, you trust me that this works. Um, so how are we doing with time? I might be able to show you the two options, but nah. Let's just do this one. So you could um have a folder. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't have my keyboard. You can have a folder, and in here you can just go. Um, let's make sure that everything is a single group, or each one of these a single group. Let's go to split group split. Okay, so now every little piece is its own uh, subtool, right? So you see all of them are in here. Um, so yeah, now we'll, what you need to do is set the home stage for this one and then do the projection separately. Um, again, it kind of like works in the same way. So let's do home stage for this one and then let's move this one around target stage, home stage, target stage, oops, home stage, target stage. <laughs> so that's going to take a while again, but you, you will see this works. I guess what I wanted to show you is that you can actually um, alter the geometry, like change the topology quite a bit, as in you can do dynamesh or, um, you know, Siri measure, which is what I'm intending to do. And Siri will maintain the position of it. So hopefully what I'm doing makes sense. Um, so I'm just replicating what I did before, but This time it should work because now each piece it's its own subtool. So now uh, we can say everything, please go back to home or everything go back to target. That's what I wanted to do. So that way we can go ahead and do this process of splitting things up. Sorry, yeah, well, splitting things up first, do the, repro the retopology, remeshing, projecting details, all of that in each one of these pieces. And then we can just go back to the um yeah to the to the home stage so the way that i'm thinking this could work is by duplicating the entire folder so i'll go to duplicate and say okay so we now have this folder that also preserves sorry all to home right it preserves the the home and the target stage so that's all in this folder and same thing with this folder. If I turn it on, I can tell all to target and all to um, to home. So uh, let's go ahead and do this. So the first folder is going to be the sketch. The second folder is going to be the the retopology, right? I'm gonna click on all to target. So there's gonna be that exploded thing, and you see these artifacts here. They indicate that they're an overlapping mesh, which is what we want. So if I turn this off, you won't see it. Cool. So what I'll do is I'm gonna go one by one doing a retopology by half. Or actually, instead of doing half, we can just use the target polygon count of. I want to have around. I don't know. Five thousand, or yeah, five thousand, six thousand for each one of these things, right? Let's go ahead and click remesh. Mm, maybe less than that. All right, so around two thousand polygons would be would be good, and I'll just need to go ahead and do the same thing for all of them. Again, this can also be automated with a macro that um, that produces the or that runs the series measure. Uh, hang on, not sure. Oh yeah. Um, 
it can be automated <laughs> again with a macro that runs a serial measure and then once it finishes it just jumps to the next sub tool runs it jumps and so on and so forth but again it's de it depends on like i don't think i use these process that i'm showing you well clearly not <laughs> otherwise i would have remembered stuff but uh this is not a process that i use often so i don't know if it's for me if it's um worth spending time building the macro to do it but if it's something that you see yourself doing uh quite a bit for your own workflow definitely automating this type of thing would be ideal uh just to speed things up for me i think it's you know it just works um if i do it manually <laughs> again because i don't have to do it often so i don't i don't mind uh, we have just a few more to go and hopefully you can see the the usefulness of customizing your you your, your own ui i mean if i had to do this manually and be jumping between the serial measure to palette and all of that uh, it's just going to be a pain whereas i just have the tools that i need and these i use often um those those tools are in my ui so that's why i use them all right so now we have all of these sub tools i'm just going to go quickly one by one all checking oops this one we missed this one that's why i was double checking oh no sorry that's already the sketch let's undo that so yeah all good so basically yeah if i do a a quick render just to show you all of the the, the separate pieces are now uh serial mesh they have a simpler topology right and the cool thing is in theory <laughs> let's see how this works if i click on switch stage all to home they all go back to where they are and i can hide these now or not hide it i think it's yeah it's hidden so i do a, a, um, a render and now i have all of these pieces zero mesh now i need to say that you don't have to do what I just did. You don't have to explode these things in order to do a serial measure. If you just do serial measure with keeping groups, you will get exactly the same thing that you see right now. The reason I'm having this home stage and target stage is that when I enable the sketch folder and I project those details back into this, I would have, I wouldn't have any issue when Zeros tries to project these things onto each other. Um, that is the main thing. So let's click on all to target. And that includes these guys, the ones that are the sketch, the first folder. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to go one by one again. And I'm just going to add, let's say, three levels of subdivision, maybe. Right? One, two, one, two, one, two. All of that can be automated. One, two, one, two, two, two. We're getting there, we're getting there. Just bear with me. All right, so now each one of these pieces have more resolution to um, to be able to have those uh, details from the sketch projected onto. Um, and because they all have, uh, this is an important thing actually, so all of these pieces should have the same subdivision level so that when we merge it back together into single one, we will retain that, um, you know, that ability to going back and forth between subdivision levels. So now that we have everything ready, all we have to do is project things again one by one. You could opt automate all of this, but I'm just going to click on, let's get closer here. Click on project all. No. <laughs> um. All right, so <laughs> hopefully um, the whole project is not um, totally lost. Give me one second, I'll be right back and I'll restart Sivrush. This thing was been about to happen. <laughs>
hey, hey, good news. I didn't lose everything. In fact, we have, um, we have everything. <laughs> so no problem at all. All good. That's the, the good thing about the quick save and auto save. So it's all good. All right. So where were we? Um, we have the second folder where we have the subdivision levels and all of that. And we have the, the sketch on top that we can project. So let's hope nothing breaked in that crash. Uh, so I'm going to project all. And now we have all the details from the sketch projected into to this mesh. There we go. I mean, we didn't have that many details, but still, you, you, get, you get the idea. Um, so yeah, we have all those details from the, the sketch projected. That works fine. Um, let's keep doing the rest. So just jump, project. It doesn't have too many details, so it should be pretty quick and straightforward. Um, it will be interesting to see how you can turn this into a series of macros that you can just click once and, and do it if you were to do this multiple times. I mean, if you work with lots of these creatures and you have to do this multiple times. That's it. All right, so I just projected everything. Obviously, um, what ZBrush does is it analyzes whatever is visible and it tries to project everything that is visible. But because we have individual subtools, you know, we only projected one. Um, so now I can do a couple of things. I can go all low just to go to the, you know, the lowest subdivision level of all of the new pieces and let's switch back to the home. Uh, sorry, all home. Excellent. So now the theory or like the practice proves the theory. <laughs> so I can turn off the sketch and now we have this piece that has, you know, well, individual pieces, individual subtools, but they all have subdivision levels, right? So what we need to do now is combine this back to one. Bit of a process here, but I think it's worth it. Um, so I'm going to go to all high. And I'm going to click on the gear icon here. And I'm going to click on uh, to, to merge folder. So merging the folder takes everything that we have in there, brings it back into a single mesh. And because everything was at the same level of subdivision, so they all had three as level of subdivision, um, everything is into one single subtool with multiple subdivision levels, with all the projections, no issues in the projection as well. And we have the ability to go back and forth between low and high. So, you know, I think it's worth it. <laughs> it might be able, you might be able to automate things a little bit, but, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty useful. If I were to just project things into, uh, actually, let me just show you. Um, maybe if maybe it works and we can just save a lot of time, but uh, I think this pr this workaround is is good. So I'll just duplicate that piece. Let's turn that off. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the to the highest subdivision level. Actually, let's delete higher and divide this a, a few times. So I'm gonna project this. Maybe it's going to work. I don't know. I don't think so, but. I'm basically projecting the the sketch. So yeah, it just does it does a pretty good job. But if I were to just hide this bit, yeah, there's there's the the artifacts. It's not super evident. It actually did a pretty decent job. So you might not even have to do all the stuff that I did. But um if you have more details or a sketch with more details, this type of artifacts that you get, um those are the problems that I was trying to avoid those things in here, right? Just because obviously Sivers doesn't really know how to project uh, things that are on top of each other. So um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully depend, depending on what you need. I think this is a, a neat workflow that uh, is worth checking out. So I'm just going to copy that, bring it back to, no, not this one, sorry. This one right here. I'm going to paste it in there and drop that into the originals. So now we have most most of the important parts we have that um you know automatically with a nicer topology. It's not perfect by any means, but it is it is decent. 
um, and we also have high subdivision levels and all of that. Uh, we can also take this guy, for example, the tentacles, and apply the subdivision so that we also have multiple levels of subdivision. So we're basically building the, the low res mesh. Um, I'm going to take that, this thing, and I think for this one, I'm just going to run my quick um, dyna dynamesh to subdivision uh, just to keep something clean. And I'm just going to also rebuild one. Um, yeah, I think this this is this is good enough. I mean, we can go for lower res resolution, but I think it's fine. Um, so now let's go ahead and do the same thing for the legs. And for the legs, I think I'm just gonna do the same uh, the same idea. So Dyna to subd. And let's have a look at the chat. Um, how do you, okay, Sculptures Pro without deleting subdivisions. Oh, you cannot use Sculptures Pro without deleting subdivisions. You'll have to go through the process of, or similar process of what I did. Mm. I think I want to do, sorry, uh, let me go back. I think I want to do a, a more control retopology on the legs. So, um, yeah, let me just do that. So I'm going to clone, I'm going to clone that, duplicate, Siri mesh that. Uh, and I have the keep groups enabled. And that is just so that Sirius keeps the different sub or the different objects separate um, separately. So that would be easier for posing and, and all of that. So yeah, I think that's maybe a little bit of polish project. All right, so yeah, that's not too bad. Just checking out all different areas. Um, there might be some issues at the projection time in here. And again, that's the same, that's the case for anything that is being, you know. Um, overlapping, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I think this works. Let's um, do a couple of subdivisions. Project everything. And we can split it. Oh, see, this is there's a there's an issue here. Oh no, Two groups. I'm just giving it uh, some polygroups so I can work a little bit faster. Yeah, so this is the projection issue that I mentioned that we didn't have with the, the other technique. So I'm just going to clean that up. And I'm cleaning it from the highest subdivision level because if I do it in the lowest subdivision level, um, I will have to spend a lot more time cleaning things up uh, in every subdivision level. So, and if you have something that is too high res and it's it's a bit um, annoying to, to try to you know smooth things out, you can use this smooth strong as well. Uh, but let's just go do polish. So we have this clean mesh now. Let's paste it in here and drop the original back in there. And this is basically what I'm gonna do now. <laughs> so let me see if there is any any questions. 
and I will just tackle those as I work on this. But it's the same process. Um, so, yep, cool. Thanks, Vanna. Uh, Vanna. Uh, which many can I find home target that is on the geometry palette and the section called stager? I believe I mentioned that. Um, I can use layer. I have the transition to each position. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you were referring to the. Um, you were referring to the. Um, the the process that we did before, if I'm not mistaken. So you could yeah, you could just do that. Um, the problem with that is that if you have this, uh, you won't be able to do the the remesh or dynamesh. Basically, with uh, sculpting layers, you cannot change the topology. You can sculpt on them, but you cannot change the topology. So it would be you still need to use the the technique I I just showed. Um, okay, this one wasn't too bad actually. That was a nice nice projection. Well, it's pretty evident in here, but it's not too bad. Um, and this is another reason actually. That's a uh, maybe that's a good point to, to talk about. Um, this is one of the reasons as well that I don't go into too many details in the in the sketching stage because when I do the projection I tend to just clean things up and that obviously is going to get rid of some of the details uh, so yeah and I can just do the details after when I have a cleaner topology. Okay let's do this one more time Um, this layer cool. Um, oh, thank you for the new comic markup. It's pretty awesome. Cool. I'm glad that you like it. Yeah, it's a it's a really nice, nice simple trick to make things look cool. <laughs> um, I'm gonna project this now. Uh, can noisemaker be used to create patterns in polypane, like just effect? in color and not the texture of the surface. Yep, by all means you just need to turn RGB on. Um, Venner, yeah, you could. You don't have um, you don't have to apply it, but if you want to apply it, you can apply it as polypaint. All right, another successful projection with not too many issues. I think most of the issues are in the tiny, tiny areas, which is good. I just need to do a bit of cleanup here. And that's good to go. Let's copy that. Paste. Uh, one more, one more to go. Clone, duplicate. I think by now you have a a good idea of this of this workflow. Um, all of these things that I'm doing again, you could you could basically have different macros and optimize it a bit more. I do have a macro, the one that is called Dyna to Subd, which does a single thing, right? Um. But I could have the same exact same process in a macro, and I could have three or four different macros depending on the level of um, of the resolution that I want to achieve with that macro. So in other words, if I want to go like really low res, I would tweak that resolution or that um, that macro to give me that low res mesh. Or if I don't mind, I just use this that I'm been using. But that's how you can refine your workflows. Um, I guess that's that's the takeaway. Like once you start using something more than once, uh, and you th you think, oh, I can definitely improve on, you know, save myself, let's say, two minutes 
by doing a macro, those two minutes will amount to a lot more over time if you do it more and more. So definitely worth trying uh, to set up a macro or something else that you can automate. Alrighty. I think we are good to go. Just want to make sure I have... Is this? No, this is not the one. Alright. So, all low. So, in theory, I think this is the only one that is maybe too high res. So, what I'll do is, I'm going to delete lower, and I'm going to clone that. And I'm just going to do the same thing that I did for the other ones. Oops. Oh. Uh, in a simple mesh like this, by the way, you could... And this is how the, the Dyna to sub the uh, macro in my in my palette works. You could just freeze subdivision levels. So you can subdivide these a few times instead of deleting them like I did. Subdivide a few times, you can freeze subdivision level, go back, obviously freezing subdivision level sends you back to the lowest one, do the Siri measure there, and then reconstruct or unfreeze the subdivision level and Siri automatically is going to project so you don't have to have two pieces. Um, to project one from in, on top of the other one. I just prefer it this this way because I can I can see all the steps that are happening and I have more I feel I have more control um over what I'm what I'm doing. But if you want to automate things a little bit more, by all means that could be a way of doing it. And that's how you can create that type of macro. Hmm. Some do all of that. There's some some weird gaps in there, probably from the fiber mesh. So I'm gonna close holes. Group visible. Um, subdivide a couple times. Project all. Yeah, a bit better. I should have just closed the the gaps on the on the actual sketch before, uh, but yeah, this works. Let's just copy that and let's move on. Okay, so all low. So now, if we go ahead and do a quick render of this guy in the low res, you'll see, except the eyes, but the eyes, you know, it's fine. <laughs> the eyes will stay like that. Uh, we have a now a low res version and a high res version of this um, this guy. So what that allows us to do is to add details in a way that we don't have to deal with the resolution of the DynaMesh. We have some nicer flow of edges and that sort of thing. So that makes it a lot easier to add high frequency details and to refine the entire mesh. So that's why um, you know I would follow this this workflow to generate a cleaner topology. Again, it's not a topology that um, necessarily can be used for animation or something like that. Although I think nowadays you can, but um, it is not perfect. It is good enough to do the details, which is what I would like to, um, to do. So we can now go all high. Let's do a quick save, because this is still the auto save or the quick save from before. Um, Um, I think you can do it without duplicating. I think you can hold Alt on History Scrubber and then Project History. Um, you can do it like that, but if you do the Project History brush, that is based on the camera, so you want it. That's that's really it's it's really tedious and it's not gonna give you a good result. You can do that with certain things, but not with everything. Um, the way to do it without duplicating is by freezing subdivision levels. Um, so yeah, that's probably the easiest way. Um, cool. Hey, Vena. Um, yeah, glad that you like the, the matcaps. <laughs> um, yeah, I sent them around in a couple of, a couple of um, emails ago. Uh, by the way, there is also, um, I there are a couple of releases 
of a collaboration that I did with NVIDIA uh, with two new tutorials and I'll show you the, the link to the artwork itself uh, which I think it ended up being quite cool and it's probably one a good example of what I was saying before that you know I tend to do a lot of different things not just one so you know if you there's a there's a big contrast between this kind of like creepy creature Geiger's thing uh, with <laughs> this more kind of like a cute character um, that I did uh, everything is done in ZBrush everything is sculpted in ZBrush I texture it in um, Substance 3D Painter and then render in Marmoset but all the the details and everything the whole setup even the the ground floor and everything is all done in ZBrush and if you go here uh, it is in my YouTube channel as well and in Nvidia's uh, creators channel as well but if you scroll the way all the way to the bottom there's a few other shots um, here is the the high res mesh Here's the low res mesh, pretty much what we have right now with the creepy one, <laughs> with the creepy creature. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, here you have the tutorial. So the first one covers kind of like a quick sketch as well as a the the modeling and all the yeah, the sculpting part. So everything that has to do with the serious part in this one. And the second part covers the uh yeah, I think they probably need to update the this here but in the second part I do uh, the Substance 3 Painter and the rendering in Marmoset so if you're interested in you know this type of style of things um, it's in there so you can just go to my profile in our station and, and I just included the uh, the tutorial in there but um, again what I what, <laughs> what I wanted to show you two things the first one is like that contrast of the things that I that I mentioned someone asked at the beginning like you know how long it takes to do things it really depends on on the project that I'm doing and I tend to just do a bunch of different things, um, very different. So this is kind of like more cute style, uh, you know, in contrast with this sort of creepy stuff. Uh, but this is the one I want to show you actually. The fact that we have, you know, something cleaner. Um, in this case, the topology is a lot better. I did, uh, I spent more time with a specific workflow that gives me a nicer topology for this creature. But even if you look at the, you know, at the feet of the character, these these loops they're not great they're not uh, you know ideal for this type of animation but it works for what I did which is this concept so that's what I wanted to show you that you could just leave it as it is uh, unless you want it for a specific purpose right cool so um let's go to this guy and I'm in this high subdivision level I'm just going to switch to a larger brush size and make sure uh, symmetry is enabled. I'm just gonna clean things up very quickly because it still has the projection of the um, of all the triangles that I use for the Sculptures Pro. Uh, we can probably just do a polish that would yeah that will soften things quite a bit. Um, and I'm gonna use the standard brush. Oh, we have like 15 minutes. So I spent too much time playing around with stuff, <laughs> um, but it's okay. So with this standard brush, I'm just going to redefine those areas a bit more. But now that I have a, a nicer topology, um, I'll keep using the smooth brush every time that I do a, a few strokes, just to keep things clean. Just gonna define this um, like a sharper line in here, and this sort of help as well to accentuate the fact that this could be like a like a hard shell, maybe. And even with the damp standard brush, uh, I'm gonna press really softly with the all key enabled, just to. I'm gonna do it hard, just to you know what I'm trying to do. So with the alt key selected, it will invert the effect, just to do that. But 
just with a subtle touch of the brush it just sort of sharpens that edge a little bit without you know being too too extreme and i think that again works um works quite well let's adjust this All right, so let's do some details for this area. Um, although I think I'm not gonna have that many details in here, but um, maybe in, in the legs actually. I'm gonna divide this one more time. So I'm gonna bring in the light box, go to brush, uh, my brushes. And this is just so that I can work a little bit faster again. Um, Let's go for the creature skin pack. And I'm gonna use the creature pattern 09. So this one gives me some like, you know, bumpy details straight away, really nice um, that I can use. So, and the cool thing about these, these brushes is that you can sculpt. So literally it follows a, a path. So it has the roll enable. So it has a pattern that follows that. Um, oops, divide that again, get more details. So yeah, I'm gonna use this, let's go into solo mode and I'm gonna also switch to the smooth picks that works really well with this type of details and these brushes. So I'm gonna go for a large set of details um, around here. Here. And at the back, I can hold the Alt key and just invert the effect of that brush as well. Gives me that sort of porosity. And mix it up with the normal effect. Just to, you know, this is this is a single brush, but you can alter it by changing the, how how hard you press on the, on your tablet. Um, inverting the effect of the brush itself to get the, the, the pores and obviously the size. So a lot of things that you can do with just one single brush. But this is why it's important to have the primary and secondary forms well defined. Because this, like, I mean, I just detail this and it takes like 15 seconds <laughs> with these brushes or with, you know, if you have like similar type of brushes that are for these type of things, it takes no time, right? So, uh, but it's because I have the other areas um, or I'm happy with the with the other areas. All right, so here I'm just gonna show you a couple more things um, that are pretty cool. So I'm gonna do something like this, just to add this. I'm gonna lock the camera as well. So, right, so I'm just gonna do that. And I'm gonna use these mask, by, uh, mask change points. And that automatically mask out those details that I did with this um, with this brush. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but the brush thumbnail itself has like the the details on the on the thumbnail are like darker than the rest, and that is just to indicate that it's a brush that also can be used with a with this type of masking. So it, it works really well, meaning that it changes the topology based on this um, leaving the surface kind of like untouched. I don't know if that makes sense. Basically, the details that is added that the brush is adding is not changing too much the underlying surface. Uh, so it's just adding details to the surface. So that's why you have these dark spots. So if you invert that, holding control and click to invert that, um, we can now either use the adjust last, right? Or my preferred method would be to use the move brush and then just push those kind of like points out a bit. So it just generates a lot of interesting, creepy details very quickly, right? And I can clear that mask and obviously just refine with the smooth brush any, anything that needs refinement. But I get a lot of these these details for free. And then of course, we can go ahead and refine that. Um, and again, just wanna mention one more time, the fact that I'm using a single brush, right? It's just how you apply that brush. And 
you you don't have to use these type of brushes by by no means you can totally do this with a standard brush again just to reiterate all these brushes and everything that I share and the resources that I have are they're they're not going to make your your sculpt better in, <laughs> I don't know like in in it's not like if you have the brushes you are automatically um going to get better at sculpting um they're just tools like anything else and the the point of those tools for me at least is that you can speed up your workflow quite a bit um but you don't have to use them so for instance if i were to do the same thing with manually with a damn standard brush i could just go ahead and start doing these type of things i would save a point in my timeline and do the same thing just change or mask change points and adjust them but you know you could do it like that so i just yeah i just don't want to sound like i'm i'm I'm, push I'm pushing my my resources um too much but i honestly use them on all my projects and i think they just save time so if you're interested in the same type of details and stuff um you're welcome to having them but they're not essential they're just tools they're just tools like anything else so how do you make them work for you all right so maybe i'll do something similar here at the back so something like this and i'm going to mask change points invert and this time I'm going to use the inflate brush a little bit or the inflate slider just to create those, you know, weird kind of like growth things. Like that. And then using the smooth brush, smooth that out. So you see how, how easy that is, right? <laughs> um, maybe a little bit more here. Um, and I have only five minutes left, so I'm just going to try to finish this. Um, this leg and hopefully the rest of them would follow a similar process so again i'm just going to do this mass change points inflate and i get that that nice effect and you know because of the the brush itself it sort of like follows that that pattern. Um, now I'm gonna refine this a bit more, but with a different pack, just because it is easy <laughs> again, and I only have five minutes. So with the skin brushes pack, there are a few cool things like this uh, shrink or wrap wrinkle wrap, and the wrinkle wrap pusher too, uh, depending on which one you want to use. So I'm gonna use the um, the wrinkle sharp, that gives you subtle. I mean, it's for it's for um. It's for subtle kind of like wrinkles in the skin, so it's pretty subtle. Uh, maybe that's not too subtle. So let's use the the wrinkle pusher that is sort of like pushing through. It's kind of like again, this is more for skin. So if I do this, you'll see that I'm just pressing really hard. But as I do that kind of like crevice, it sort of like pushes the geometry out, like inflates out. Um, yeah, this is like a more advanced brush, and this is the type of things that I'm hoping to cover in the. Um, oh, sorry, I still <laughs> I still have that graphic on the Acid Library Workshop. Um, you know how to make these things work for yourself, but with this brush, you know I can just sort of push the details, and it doesn't override the details that I did with the other brush. So, you know I can I can refine this type of crevices very easily so of course there is some manual work um, I honestly really enjoy this part once I, everything is in place everything has you know the subdivisions and it's good to go I can just spend all my time um, refining things and playing around with this type of details and you know the transition between one into the other uh, trying to make different areas or trying to make the the material look like the material i want from the sculpting without any texture um, and that is usually achieved throughout this adding this type of surface detail so i want to create kind of like a crab yeah crab detail like a crab screen 
Um, does that make sense? <laughs> And I still have the uh, smooth peaks that comes with ZBrush, by the way. So that's what I'm using to smooth every now and again. And that respects all the details that I've that I've been creating to a degree. Okay. So um, yeah, a couple more minutes. And again, if you want to do things manually, you can. Let me just show you quickly. So let's let's say if I want to refine this area a bit more. Uh, with you know with a standard brush and stuff like that I can hold the control key and that saves a point in time and then I'm just going to do maybe with a bit more intensity and maybe without the lazy mouse just let get some details faster so I'll, I'll just do this relatively quickly adding some details like so Right, and you'll see because I have this white point, this is what I set as my uh, undo history point. So hold Control, click, and do that, um, and then I can click on mask change points. And Siri is going to look at this point, and it's going to mask everything from this point to where I am right now. So everything that I did from that point, all these details, and I can on invert the mask, go to inflate, and do this kind of like cool growth, weird stuff <laughs> that I think looks quite cool. Uh, but again, that's, that is more manual. That's why I said you don't really need the brushes. If you want to do it like this, you totally can. And clear the mask and just smooth things out again. And I'm going to use the, the clay brush, tiny, tiny details just to, to make sure and kind of like justify that why these, these bumps are in here for a reason so that they kind of like extend or it's it's just working on the transitions really <laughs> so that's all, all that's all there is so they transition nicely into that sort of joint and I'll probably have to do the same thing at the bottom as well uh, but yeah so hopefully that gives you some ideas um, you can get out of solo mode and you see that you know the the level of details on this one is it's pretty good compared to the rest, right? But it's more of the same. I mean, the details, we did that in the last 15 minutes anyway. So, um, yeah. And now if I switch, oh, switch to the comic material. Maybe it is too detailed for a comic. So you have to, you have to play around with that. Um, no, I wanted to, do another one. Um, so let me see materials. Uh, this one right here. So the kind of like the Geiger style material. It showcases those details nicely um, with a darker color. There we go. So yeah, hopefully that is being of help, guys. Um, we we, I mean, it doesn't look like we didn't need much or like we uh, make too many uh, progress, but or too much progress, but we did. <laughs> so we have everything ready to just do details. Um, hopefully we have time in the next session and continue with this one. We'll see how we go. I might you know find some time in between and just polish everything like I did with the leg uh, but if anything we can just continue in the next session um, all right so last minute question let me just check the chat and we'll wrap it up um, this is if you are illustrating so also creating the oh sorry I think I missed a couple of questions, but don't know, have don't have much time. Lobster shell, yeah, cool. All right, guys. Um, hopefully you you find this um useful. Again, just as a final reminder, because I have limited seats, 
the asset library workshop might be closing this week or early the next week because the the live session starts uh on for me it would be the 30th of may or the 29th of may i have to check um so yeah it i have limited seats because it's a, a live workshop of intensive five days of just producing cool assets um so as soon as i reach capacity for the people that I can sort of service in the workshop, I will close the uh, enrollment. But right now it's still open. There are still a few um, spots left. If you want to join, by all means, I would love to have you. All right, guys, I'll leave you here. I'll leave you here, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks.